Arthur's Hall, Part Two, in Weird Tales, Volume One, by E. T. A. Hoffman, translated by J. T. Bilby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Now you know, my kind sir, what is the matter with my good father," said the youth softly and gently. "A cruel destiny has stripped off all the blossoms of his life." and for several years past he has been insensible to the art for which he once lived. He spends days and days sitting in front of a piece of outstretched primed canvas, with his eyes fixed upon it in a stare. That he calls painting. Into what an overwrought condition the description of such a picture brings him, you have just seen for yourself. Besides this, he is haunted by another unhappy thought, which makes my life to be a sad and agitated one, but I regard it as a fatality by which I am swept along in the same stream that has caught him. You would like something to help you to recover from this extraordinary scene? Please follow me then into the adjoining room, where you will find several pictures of my father's early days, when he was still a productive artist." and great was Trogut's astonishment to find a row of pictures apparently painted by the most illustrious masters of the Netherlands school. For the most part, they represented scenes taken from real life. For example, a company returning from hunting, another amusing themselves with singing and playing, and such like subjects. They bore evidences of great thought, and particularly the expression of the heads, which were realized with especially vigorous lifelike power. Just as Traugott was about to return into the former room, he noticed another picture close beside the door, which held him fascinated to the spot. It was a remarkably pretty maiden, dressed in old German style, but her face was exactly like the youth's, only fuller and with a little more color in it, and she seemed to be somewhat taller, too. A tremor of nameless delight ran through Traugott at the sight of this beautiful girl, in strength and vitality, the picture was quite equal to anything by Van Dyck. The dark eyes were looking down upon Traugott with a soft, yearning look, whilst her sweet lips appeared to be half open, ready to whisper loving words. Oh, heaven, good heaven, sighed Traugott with a sigh that came from the very bottom of his heart. Where, oh, where can I find her? Let us go, said the youth. Then Traugott cried in a sort of rapturous frenzy, Oh, it is indeed she, the beloved of my soul, whom I have so long carried about in my heart, but whom I only knew in vague stirrings of emotion. Where? Oh, where is she? The tears started from young Berklinger's eyes. He appeared to be shaken by a convulsive and sudden attack of pain, and to control himself with difficulty. Come along, he said at length in a firm voice. That is a portrait of my unhappy sister, Felicia. Note, the name in the text is Felicitas, Felicity. Felicia has been adopted in the translation as being the nearest approach to it. Felicity would in all probability be extremely strange to English ears, besides being liable to lead to ambiguities. Return to text. She is gone forever. You will never see her. Like one in a dream, Traugott suffered himself to be led into the other room. The old man was still sleeping, but all at once he started up, and staring at Traugott with eyes flashing with anger, he cried, What do you want? What do you want, sir? Then the youth stepped forward and reminded him that he had just been showing his new picture to Traugott. Had he forgotten? At this, Berklinger appeared to recollect all that had passed. It was evident that he was much affected, and he replied in an undertone, Pardon an old man's forgetfulness, my good sir. Your new piece is an admirable and excellent work, Master Berklinger, Tarkett proceeded. I have never seen anything equal to it. I am sure it must cost a great deal of study and an immense amount of labor before a man can advance so far as to turn out a work like that. I discern that I have an inextinguishable propensity for art, and I earnestly entreat you, my good old master, to accept me as your pupil. You will find me industrious. The old man grew quite cheerful and amiable, and embracing Trobert, he promised that he would be a faithful master to him. Thus it came to pass that Trobert visited the old painter every day that came, 
and made very rapid progress in his studies. He now conceived an unconquerable disgust of business, and was so careless that Herr Elias Ross had to speak out and openly find fault with him. And finally, he was very glad when Traugott kept away from the office altogether, on the pretext that he was suffering from a lingering illness. For this same reason, the wedding, to Christina's no little annoyance, was indefinitely postponed. "'Your hair target seems to be suffering from some secret trouble,' said one of Herr Elias Rose's merchant friends to him one day. "'Perhaps it's the balance of some old love affair that he's anxious to settle before the wedding day. He looks very pale and distracted.' "'And why shouldn't he then rejoin Herr Elias?' "'I wonder now,' he continued after a pause, "'I wonder now if that little rogue Christina "'has been having words with him. "'My bookkeeper, the love smitten old ass, "'he is always kissing and squeezing her hand. "'Traugott's devilishly in love with my little girl, I know. "'Can there be any jealousy? "'Well, I'll sound my young gentleman. "'But however carefully he sounded, "'he could find no satisfactory bottom. "'And he said to his merchant friend, that Traugott is a most peculiar fellow. Well, I must just let him go his own way. Though, if he had not fifty thousand dollars in my business, I know what I should do, since now he never does a stroke of anything. Traugott, absorbed in art, would now have led a real bright, sunshiny life, had his heart not been torn with passionate love for the beautiful Felicia, whom he often saw in wonderful dreams. The picture had disappeared. The old man had taken it away, and Traugott durst not ask him about it without risk of seriously offending him. On the whole, old Berklinger continued to grow more confidential, and instead of taking any honorarium for his instruction, he permitted Traugott to help out his narrow housekeeping in many ways. From young Berklinger, Traugott learned that the old man had been obviously taken in in the sale of a little cabinet, and that the stock which Traugott had realized for them was all that they had left of the price received for it, as well as all the money they possessed. But it was only seldom that Traugott was allowed to have any confidential conversation with the youth. The old man watched over him with the most singular jealousy, and at once scolded him sharply if he began to converse freely and cheerfully with their friend. This Traugott felt all the more painfully, since he had conceived a deep and heartfelt affection for the youth, owing to his striking likeness to Felicia. Indeed, he often fancied, when he stood near the young man, that he was standing beside the picture he loved so much, now alive and breathing, and that he could feel her soft breath on his cheek, and then he would like to have drawn the youth, as if he really were his darling Felicia herself, to his swelling heart. Winter was past. Beautiful spring was filling the woods and fields with brightness and blossoms. Harry Elias rose advised Traugott either to drink whey for his health's sake or to go somewhere to take the baths. Fair Christina was again looking forward with joy to the wedding, although Traugott seldom showed himself and thought still less of his relations with her. Once Traugott was confined to the office the whole day long, making a requisite squaring up of his accounts, etc., he had been obliged to neglect his meals and it was beginning to get very dark when he reached Berklinger's remote dwelling. He found nobody in the first room, but from the one adjoining he heard the music of a lute. He had never heard the instrument there before. He listened. A song, from time to time interrupted, accompanied the music like a low, soft sigh. He opened the door. Oh, heaven! With her back towards him sat a female figure, dressed in old German style with a high lace ruff, exactly like the picture. At the noise which Traugott unavoidably made on entering, the figure rose, laid the lute on the table, and turned round. It was she, Felicia herself. Felicia! cried Traugott, enraptured, and he was about to throw himself at the feet of his beloved divinity when he felt a powerful hand laid upon his collar behind, and himself dragged out of the room by someone with the strength of a giant. "'You abandoned wretch, you incomparable villain!' screamed old Berklinger, pushing him on before him. "'So that was your love for art. Do you mean to murder me?' And therewith he hurled him out at the door, whilst a knife glittered in his hand. 
Traugott flew downstairs and hurried back home, stupefied, nay, half crazy with mingled delight and terror. He tossed restlessly on his couch, unable to sleep. Felicia! Felicia! he exclaimed time after time, distracted with pain and the pangs of love. You are there! You are there, and I may not see you, may not clasp you in my arms. You love me. Oh, yes, that I know. From the pain which pierces my breast so savagely, I feel that you love me. The morning sun shone brightly into Trogut's chamber. Then he got up, and determined, let the cost be what it might, that he would solve the mystery of Berklinger's house. He hurried off to the old man but his feelings may not be described when he saw all the windows wide open and the maid-servants busy sweeping out the rooms. He was struck with a presentiment of what had happened. Berklinger had left the house late on the night before, along with his son, and was gone nobody knew where. A carriage drawn by two horses had fetched away the box of paintings and the two little trunks which contained all Berklinger's scanty property. He and his son had followed half an hour later. All inquiries as to where they had gone remained fruitless. No livery stable keeper had let out horses and carriage to persons such as Trapet described, and even at the town gates he could learn nothing for certain. In short, Berklinger had disappeared as if he had flown away on the mantle of Mephistopheles. Note. A mode of aerial conveyance made use of on occasion by the personage named in the popular Faust legend. Return to text. Traugott went back home, prostrated by despair. She is gone. She is gone. The beloved of my soul. All, all is lost. Thus he cried as he rushed past Herr Elias Rose, for he happened to be just at that moment in the entrance hall, towards his own room. God bless my soul, cried Harry Elias, pulling and tugging at his wig. Christina! Christina! he shouted, till the whole house echoed. Christina, you disgraceful girl, my good-for-nothing daughter! The clerks and others in the office rushed out with terrified faces. The bookkeeper asked, amazed, but Herr Rose... Herr Rose, however, continued to scream without stopping, Christina! Christina! At this point, Miss Christina stepped in through the house door, and raising her broad-brimmed straw hat just a little, and smiling, asked what her good father was bawling in this outrageous way for. I strictly beg you will let such unnecessary running away alone, Harry Elias began to storm at her. My son-in-law is a melancholy fellow and as jealous as a Turk. You'd better stay quietly at home, or else there'll be some mischief done. My partner is in there screaming and crying about his betrothed, because she will gad about so. Christina looked at the bookkeeper, astounded, but he gave a significant glance in the direction of the cupboard in the office where Herr Rose was in the habit of keeping his cinnamon water. You'd better go in and console your betrothed, he said as he strode away. Christina went up to her own room, only to make a slight change in her dress, and give out the clean linen, and discuss with the cook what would have to be done about the Sunday roast joint, and at the same time pick up a few items of town gossip. Then she would go at once and see what really was the matter with her betrothed. You know, kindly reader, that we, all of us, when in Trogut's case, have to go through our appointed stages. We can't help ourselves. Despair is succeeded by a dull, dazed sort of moody reverie, in which the crisis is wont to occur. And this then passes over into a milder pain in which nature is able to apply her remedies with effect. It was in this stage of sad but beneficial pain that some days later Traugott again sat on the Carlsberg, gazing out as before upon the sea waves and the grey, misty clouds which had gathered over Hela. But he was not seeking, as before, to discover the destiny reserved for him in days to come. No, for all that he had hoped for, all that he had dimly dreamt of, had vanished. Oh, said he, my call to art was a bitter, bitter deception. 
Felicia was the phantom who deluded me into the belief in that which never had any other existence but in the insane fancy of a fever-stricken mind. It's all over. I will give it all up and go back into my dungeon. I have made up my mind. I will go back. Charlotte again went back to his work in the office, whilst the wedding day with Christina was once more fixed. On the day before the wedding was to come off, Charlotte was standing in Arthur's hall, looking, not without a good deal of heart-rending sadness, at the fateful figures of the old burgomaster and his page, when his eye fell upon the broker to whom Berklinger was trying to sell his stock. Without pausing to think, almost mechanically, in fact, he walked up to him and asked, did you happen to know the strikingly curious old man with the curly beard who some time ago frequently used to be seen here along with a handsome youth? Why, to be sure I did, answered the broker. That was the crack-brained old painter Gottfried Berklinger. Then don't you know where he has gone to and where he is now living? asked Trapper again. Ay, that I do, replied the broker. He has now for a long time been living quietly at Sorrento, along with his daughter. With his daughter Felicia? asked Trabot so vehemently and so loudly that everybody turned round to look at him. Why, yes, went on the broker calmly. That was, you know, the pretty youth who always followed the old man about everywhere. Half Dunsick knew that he was a girl, notwithstanding that the crazy old fellow thought there was not a single soul could guess it. It had been prophesied to him that if his daughter were ever to get married, he would die a shameful death. And accordingly, he determined never to let anybody know anything about her. And so he passed her off everywhere as his son. Traugott stood like a statue. Then he ran off through the streets, away out of the town gates, into the open country, into the woods, loudly lamenting, Oh, miserable wretch that I am! It was she, she herself. I have sat beside her scores and hundreds of times, have breathed her breath, pressed her delicate hands, looked into her beautiful eyes, heard her sweet words, and now I have lost her. No, not lost. I will follow her into the land of art. I acknowledge the finger of destiny. Away, away to Sorrento. He hurried back home. Harry Elias Rose got in his way. Traugott laid hold of him and carried him along with him into the room. I shall never marry Christina, never, he screamed. She looks like voluptas, pleasure, and luxurious wantonness, and her hair is like that of Ira, wrath, in the picture in Arthur's Hall. Oh, Felicia, Felicia, my beautiful darling, why do you stretch out your arms so longingly towards me? I am coming, I am coming. And now let me tell you, Herr Elias, he continued, again laying hold of the pale merchant, you will never see me in your damned office again. Or do I care for your cursed ledgers and day books? I am a painter, I and a good painter too. Becklinger is my master, my father, my all, and you are nothing, nothing at all. And therewith he gave Herr Elias a good shaking. Harry Elias, however, began to shout at the top of his voice, Help! Help! Come here, folks! Help! My son-in-law's gone mad! My partner's in a raging fit! Help! Help! Everybody came running out of the office. Traugott had released his hold upon Elias and now sank down exhausted in a chair. They all gathered round him, but when he suddenly leapt to his feet and cried with a wild look, What do you all want? They all hurried off out of the room in a string. Harry Elias in the middle. Soon afterwards there was a rustling of a silk dress, and a voice asked, Have you really gone crazed, my dear Herr Traugott, or are you only jesting? It was Christina. I am not the least bit crazed, my angel, replied Traugott, nor is it one whit truer that I am jesting. Pray compose yourself, my dear, but our wedding won't come off tomorrow. I shall never marry you, neither tomorrow nor at any other time. There is not the least need of it, said Christina, very calmly. I have not been particularly pleased with you for some time, and someone I know will value it far differently, if he may only lead home as his bride the rich and pretty Miss Christina Rose. Adieu. Therewith she rustled off. She means the bookkeeper, thought Traugott. 
As soon as he had calmed down somewhat, he went to Herr Elias and explained to him in convincing terms that he need not expect to have him either as his son-in-law or as his partner in the business. Herr Elias reconciled himself to the inevitable and repeated with downright honest joy in the office again and again that he thanked God to have got rid of that crazy-headed Traugott, even after the latter was a long, long way distant from Dunsey. On at length arriving at the long for country, Traugott found a new life awaiting him, bright and brilliant. At Rome he was introduced to the circle of the German colony of painters and shared in their studies. Thus it came to pass that he stayed there longer than would seem to have been permissible in the face of his longing to find Felicia again, by which he had hitherto been so restlessly urged onwards. But his longing was now grown weaker. It shaped itself in his heart like a fascinating dream, whose misty shimmer enveloped his life on all sides, so that he believed that all he did and thought, and all his artistic practice, were turned towards the higher supernatural regions of blissful intuitions. All the female figures which his now experienced artistic skill enabled him to create bore lovely, felicious features. The young painters were greatly struck by the exquisitely beautiful face, the original of which they in vain sought to find in Rome. They overwhelmed Traugott with multitudes of questions as to where he had seen the beauty. Traugott, however, was very shy of telling of his singular adventure in Danzig, until at last, after the lapse of several months, an old Königsberg friend, Matuszewski by name, who had come to Rome to devote himself entirely to art, declared joyfully that he had seen there, in Rome, the girl whom Traugott copied in all his pictures. Traugott's wild delight may be imagined. He no longer concealed what it was that had attracted him so strongly to art, and urged him on with such irresistible power into Italy, and his Danzig adventure proved so singular and so attractive that they all promised to search eagerly for the lost loved one. Matuszewski's efforts were the most successful. He had soon found out where the girl lived, and discovered, moreover, that she really was the daughter of a poor old painter, who just at that period was busy putting a new coat on the walls of the church of Trinita del Monte. All these things agreed nicely. Traugott at once hastened to the church in question along with Matuszewski. And in the painter, whom he saw working up on a very high scaffolding, he really thought he recognized old Berklinger. Thence the two friends hurried off to the old man's dwelling, without having been noticed by him. It is she, cried Traugott, when he saw the painter's daughter standing on the balcony, occupied with some sort of feminine work. Felicia! "'My Felicia!' he exclaimed aloud in his joy as he burst into the room. The girl looked up, very much alarmed. She had Felicia's features, but it was not Felicia. In his bitter disappointment, poor Traugott's wounded heart was rent as if from innumerable dagger thrusts. In a few words, Matuszewski explained all to the girl. In her pretty, shy confusion, with her cheeks deep crimson and her eyes cast down upon the ground, she made a marvellously attractive picture to look at, and Traugott, whose first impulse had been quickly to retire, nevertheless, after casting but a single pained glance at her, remained standing where he was, as though held fast by silken bonds. His friend was not backward in saying all sorts of complimentary things to pretty Dorina, and so helped her to recover from the constraint and embarrassment into which she had been thrown by the extraordinary manner of their entrance. Dorina raised the dark, fringed curtains of her eyes and regarded the stranger with a sweet smile and said that her father would soon come home from his work and would be very pleased to see some German painters, for he esteemed them very highly. Traugott was obliged to confess that, exclusive of Felicia, no girl had ever excited such a warm interest in him as Dorina did. She was, in fact, almost a second Felicia, the only differences were that Dorina's features seemed to him less delicate and more sharply cut, and her hair was darker. It was the same picture, only painted by Raphael instead of by Rubens. It was not long before the old gentleman came in, and Robert now plainly saw that he had been greatly misled by the height of the scaffolding in the church on which the old man had stood. 
Instead of his being the strong Berklinger, he was a thin, mean-looking little old man, timid and crushed by poverty. A deceptive accidental light in the church had given his clean-shaved chin an appearance similar to Berklinger's black curly beard. In conversing about art matters, the old man unfolded considerable ripe practical knowledge, and Traugott made up his mind to cultivate his acquaintance. Although his introduction to the family had been so painful, their society now began to exercise a more and more agreeable influence upon him. Dorina, the incarnation of grace and childlike ingenuousness, plainly allowed her preference for the young German painter to be seen, and Traugott warmly returned her affection. He grew so accustomed to the society of the pretty child she was but fifteen that he often spent the whole day with the little family. His studio he transferred to the spacious apartment which stood empty next their rooms. And finally he established himself in the family itself. Hence he was able of his prosperity to do much in a delicate way to relieve their straitened circumstances. And the old man could not very well think otherwise than that Travick would marry Dorina and he even said so to him without reservation. This put Traugott in no little consternation, for he now distinctly recollected the object of his journey, and perceived where it seemed likely to end. Felicia again stood before his eyes instinct with life, but on the other hand he felt that he could not leave Dorina. His vanished darling he could not, for some extraordinary reason, conceive of as being his wife. She was pictured in his imagination as an intellectual vision that he could neither lose nor win. Oh, to be imminent in his beloved intellectually forever, never to have her and own her physically. But Dorina was often in his thoughts as his dearly loved wife, and as often as he contemplated the idea of again binding himself in the indissoluble bonds of betrothal, note, in Germany, the betrothal is a more significant act than in England, and by some regarded as more sacred and binding than the actual marriage ceremony, returned to text. He felt a delicious tremor run through him, and a gentle warmth pervade his veins. And yet he regarded it as unfaithfulness to his first love. Thus Traugott's heart was the scene of contest between the most contradictory feelings. He could not make up his mind what to do, he avoided the old painter, and he, accordingly, feared Traugott intended to receive his dear child. He had, moreover, already spoken of Traugott's wedding as a settled thing, and it was only under this impression that he had tolerated Dorina's familiar intimacy with Traugott, which otherwise would have given the girl an ill name. The blood of the Italian boiled within him, and one day he roundly declared to Traugott that he must either marry Dorina or leave him for he would not tolerate this familiar intercourse an hour longer. Traugott was tormented by the keenest annoyance, as well as by the bitterest vexation. The old man he viewed in the light of a vile matchmaker. His own actions and behavior were contemptible, and that he had ever deserted Felicia he now judged to be sinful and abominable. His heart was sore wounded at parting from Dorina, but with a violent effort he tore himself free from the sweet bond. He hastened away to Naples, to Sorrento. He spent a whole year in making the strictest inquiries after Berklinger and Felicia, but all was in vain. Nobody knew anything about them. The sole gleam of intelligence that he could find was a vague sort of presumption, which was founded merely upon the tradition that an old German painter had been seen in Sorrento several years before, and that was all. After being driven backwards and forwards like a boat on the restless sea, Traugott at length came to a stand in Naples, and in proportion as his industry in art pursuits again awakened, the longing for Felicia, which he cherished in his bosom, grew softer and milder. But he never saw any pretty girl, if she was the least like Dorina in figure, movement, or bearing, without feeling most bitterly the loss of the dear sweet child. Yet when he was painting... He never thought of Dorina, but always of Felicia. She continued to be his constant ideal. At length he received letters from his native town. Ere Elias Rose had departed this life, his business ancient wrote, and Traugott's presence was required in order to settle matters with the bookkeeper, who had married Miss Christina and undertaken the business. 
Traugott hurried back to Danzig by the shortest route. Again he was standing in Arthur's Hall, leaning against the granite pillar opposite the burgomaster and the page. He dwelt upon the wonderful adventure which had had such a painful influence upon his life, and, a prey to deep, hopeless sadness, he stood and looked with a set, fixed gaze upon the youth, who greeted him with living eyes, as it were, and whispered in a sweet and charming voice, "'And so you could not desert me, then, after all?' "'Can I believe my eyes? "'Is it really your own respected self come back again, "'safe and sound and quite cured of your unpleasant melancholy?' "'croaked a voice near Travet. "'It was the well-known broker. "'I have not found her,' escaped Travet involuntarily. "'Whom do you mean? "'Whom has your honour not found?' asked the broker. "'The painter Gottfriedus Berklinger. "'And his daughter, Felicia,' rejoined Travet. I have searched all Italy for them. Not a soul knew anything about them in Sorrento. This made the broker open his eyes and stare at him, and he stammered, Where, do you say, you have searched for Berklinger and Felicia? In Italy? In Naples? In Sorrento? Why, yes, to be sure, replied Trapet very testily, whereupon the broker struck his hands together several times in succession, crying as he did so, Did you ever now? Did you ever hear tell such a thing? But Herr Traugott, Herr Traugott. Well, what is there to be so much astonished at, rejoined Traugott? Don't behave in such a foolish fashion, pray. Of course, a man will travel as far as Sorrento for his sweetheart's sake. Yes, yes, I loved Felicia and followed her. But the broker skipped about on one foot and continued to say, Well, now, did you ever, did you ever until Traugott placed his hand earnestly upon his arm and asked, Come, tell me then, in heaven's name, what is it that you find so extraordinary? The broker began, But, my good Herr Traugott, do you mean to say you don't know that Herr Aloysius Brandstetter, our respected town councillor and the senior of our guild, calls his little villa in that small firwood at the foot of Carlsberg, in the direction of Conrad's hammer, by the name of Sorrento. He bought Berklinger's pictures of him, and took the old man and his daughter into his house, that is, out to Sorrento. And there they lived for several years. And if you, my respected Herr Traugott, had only gone and planted your own two feet on the middle of the Carlsberg, you could have had a view right into the garden and could have seen Miss Felicia walking about there, dressed in curious old German style like the women in those pictures. There was no need for you to go to Italy. Afterwards, the old man. But that is a sad story. Never mind, go on, said Trapet hoarsely. Yes, continued the broker. Young Branstetter came back from England saw Miss Felicia and fell in love with her. Coming unexpectedly upon the young lady in the garden, he fell upon his knees before her, in romantic fashion, and swore that he would wed her and deliver her from the tyrannical slavery in which her father kept her. Close behind the young people, without their having observed it, stood the old man. And the very selfsame moment in which Felicia said, I will be yours, he fell down with a stifled scream and was dead as a doornail. It said he looked very, very hideous, all blue and bloody, because he had by some inexplicable means burst an artery. After that, Miss Felicia could not bear young Branstetter at all, and at last she married Mathesius, criminal and all counsellor of Marian Werder. Your honour, as an old flame, should go and see the Frau criminal rotten. Marian Vetter is not so far, you know, as your real Italian Sorrento. The good lady is said to be very comfortable and to have enriched the world with diverse children. Silent and crushed, Traugott hastened from the hall. This issue of his adventure filled him with awe and dread. No, it is not she, it is not she, he cried. It is not Felicia, that divine image which enkindled an infinite longing in my bosom whom I followed into yon distant land, seeing her before me everywhere where I went, like my star of fortune, twinkling and glittering with sweet hopes. Felicia, criminal rotten, Mathesius, 
<laughs> Criminal rotting, the Theseus. Traugott, shaken by extreme sensations of misery, laughed aloud and hastened in his usual way through the Oliver Gate along the Langfur to the Carlsberg. Note. Langfur, a suburb of Danzig on the northwest, three and a half miles nearer than Carlsberg. It is connected with the city by a double avenue of fine limes. Return to text. He looked down into Sorrento, and the tears gushed from his eyes. Oh, he cried, oh, how deep, how incurably deep an injury, O oh, thou eternal ruling power, does thy bitter irony inflict upon poor man's soft heart. But no, no. But why should the child cry over the incurable pain, when instead of enjoying the light and warmth, he thrusts his hand into the flames? Destiny visibly laid its hand upon me, but my dimmed vision did not recognize the higher nature at work, and I had the presumption to delude myself with the idea that the forms created by the old master and mysteriously awakened to life which stepped down to meet me were my own equals and that I could draw them down into the miserable transitoriness of earthly existence. No, no, Felicia, I have never lost you. You are and will be mine forever, for you yourself are the creative artistic power dwelling within me. Now, and only now, have I first come to know you. What have you? What? Have I to do with the criminal rotten Mathesius? I fancy nothing at all. Neither did I know what you should have to do with her, my respected Herr Traugott, a voice broke in. Traugott awakened out of his dream. Strange to say, he found himself, without knowing how he got there, again leaning against the granite pillar in Arthur's hall. The person who had spoken the above-mentioned words was Christina's husband. He handed to Traugott a letter, that had just arrived from Rome. Matuszewski wrote, Dorina is prettier and more charming than ever. Only pale with longing for you, my dear friend. She is expecting you every hour, for she is most firmly convinced that you could never be untrue to her. She loves you with all her heart. When shall we see you again? I am very pleased that we settled all our business this morning, said Traugott to Christina's husband, after he had read this. For tomorrow I set out for Rome, where my bride is most anxiously longing for me. End of Arthur's Hall End of Volume 1 of Weird Tales by E.T.A. Hoffman Translated by J.T. Bealby Recording by Thomas Copeland